begin this morning. John chapter 18. How many of you know that in society today, and in the world that we live in, that that God is on trial, pretty much. That your Christian faith, our, our beliefs as a Christian, the Word of God, our standards, our morals, our, our God-given principles are always put into question in the world today. Everything that, that you know that the Word of God holds true is always being questioned by the world. So John 18 Begin with verse 28. Pick up the story here of Jesus, and he's already... A little backdrop to this. Jesus has already been in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's already prayed where he sweated great drops of blood and where he took upon himself the sins of the world. And he said, basically, it was was an exchanging of, of wills. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass before me. But nevertheless, thy will be done in, in my life. And he knew that what was coming next was the betrayal uh, of Judas the kiss there and that the Pharisees would come and, and the guards would arrest him and he would be ultimately taken on the beginning journey there, that night's journey, where he would be led to the slaughter, the lamb to be slaughtered, to give that ultimate sacrifice. He knew that it was the the beginning there and it, it's already begun and he's already... Uh, in, the, in the stages of this, as we pick up here in John 18, beginning with verse 28, and he's brought before Pilate's court. The Pharisees bring him before Pilate because they didn't, they couldn't just murder Jesus. They were going to go through the legal system, and they wanted to to legally, you know, have him executed. And especially here at Passover, they couldn't have any blood on their hands supposedly and be clean for Passover. So. They can't even go in Pilate's uh, court because the Pharisees can't because they would defile themselves by going into a Gentile's home. So they won't even go into his court, but they send Jesus in there and they want Pilate to bring down the judgment upon Jesus. As we begin to look at this text here, as I begin to read, I want you to think from the perspective of, of Pilate's perspective. Pilate was not a Jew. He was a Roman soldier. He was an authority figure there in Israel at the time, in Jerusalem. And basically he was you had had the authority to uh, to arrest and to hold in prison or whatever or to execute anyone he wanted to. Uh, He had the authority from Caesar to do that, and he was the the ruling uh, power there in that area. So in verse twenty eight says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. And it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he should die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? 
And when he had said this, he went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. I want to talk to you this morning about a subject. What is truth? Jesus is standing there before Pilate. And Jesus stands there before Pilate awaiting his sentence. The creator of the universe stands before his creation. The sovereign judge is on trial. And today in our lives and today in the world, God's on trial. You know, the, the liberal left or whatever is always accusing, I'll say the righteous right, of always being the ones that are bigots or whatever or stand in the way of progress. Thank God that we stand in the way of sin. Amen? Because if the church didn't stand in the way of it, it would fully take over. But thank God there are men and women that stand up for what's right. Amen? That stand up for moral law. Stand up for purity. That stand up for thus saith the Lord. They don't bow their knee to the things of the world. God is on trial today as liberals and politically correct activists push their agendas. They are slowly chipping away at the bedrock of our Christian faith. Gay marriage, removal of anything to do with Christian, uh, with, with Christendom, with our Christian, uh, our founding fathers as a nation was founded in biblical truth. And everything is being removed, stripped away. Nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with Jesus. Abortion. All these things that are happening and it's multiplying rapidly. I was reading uh, some articles this week and as I began to read, I read some of the posts that people were putting up and, you know, they're even passing laws. It was, first it was the, the, the gay marriage agenda, you know, and now it's that they're wanting to pass Laws about polygamy, you know, and everything else that you can have more than one wife, more than one husband, you know, multiple spouses. And it just, the, the depth of sin and the evil just keeps on expanding. And it's expanding rapidly. And I can't help but to look at Revelations where, I believe it's Revelations 12, 11 or eleven twelve, where Jesus said, said, because he knew the end was near, Satan knew the end was near, he came upon the earth in great wrath. And I believe today we're seeing that as Bishop's been preaching about the four horsemen, we're seeing these things, they're expediating. They're being expediated. It's like he knows he's limited in time, so he's got to get as much done to corrupt God's creation and what God ordained. He's got to corrupt as much as he can before he knows that his time is up. They don't care if you pray as long as you don't pray in the name of Jesus. Why? Because there's power in that name. The Bible says that at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. That the demons do know Him and they tremble. Amen? Why do you think they don't want the name of Jesus being released at a football game? Why? Because if one righteous stands up and declares the name of Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, then that means every demon around that area has to bow down their knee to the name of Jesus. That means the demons that are in control of someone, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of wickedness of this present age, the demonic forces that are in control of people's lives, they shrink back and shrivel and cower at the name of Jesus. When a true child of God stands in His place of authority and declares, I am a child of the living God, Jesus is my Lord, then that demon spirit that is in control there in that person's life has to back up. Guys, we don't realize who we are. You don't know who you are. The truth of the matter is that we've been deceived. It grieves me in my heart that we come to church and we're not 
enthusiastic about the things of God. There's no zeal for God's house anymore. David said, zeal for your house has consumed me. It's taken me over. That I've got to, I've got to be in your presence, God. I've got to honor you. I've got to obey you. Zeal for Him. There's no fervor for the things of God anymore. We're passive Christians. Very passive. It's the blase, blase, whatever will be, will be type scenario. And you look at all the things going on around us and we wonder, well, I can't do anything about that. It'll happen anyways. If a minority group can band together and push their agenda to change a whole nation from proclaiming that marriage is between one woman and one man, that constitutes a marriage and a family union. If they can band together and get that law passed and changed, why can't the church rise up? Amen? And change things. Why can't we change the political tide in our nation? I'm tired of every time something happens in our country that the news media jumps on the bandwagon and they've got to exploit whatever situation it is or circumstance it is to push their agenda. It's being pushed down our throats. I see in here today a diversity of people. Diversified. Why? Because we're not about a black culture or a white culture or a Hispanic culture or whatever it is. We're about a kingdom culture. Amen? We are of one creed in here and it is the blood of Jesus Christ. There is neither bond nor free nor Greek nor Jew, but we are one in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's about a kingdom. These are my brothers and my sisters. We are joint heirs seated together in heavenly places. But this nation wants to cause divide. Church, we are the church of the, G- of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are one body, one mind, one spirit. And if anybody's going to show this nation that there is no racial divide, it's got to be us, the church. That we have common ground. It's the blood of Jesus. Amen? Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not that you're black or white, but it's that you are a sinner saved by grace. I know bad things happen and there is evil present out in the world and there's things that are being done and said that are causing great divides, but we have to stand together in unity. And that means... That if something's done to our black brothers or whatever, the white brothers have to stand up and say, that wasn't right. Amen? Amen. And if it's versified, you have to stand with us too. Amen? We have to learn to stand together and say, I've got your back. That I've got your back. We have to learn to stand as one and not let these divides that the world is flooding in, this deceitful, lying spirit to come in and creep into the church and try to cause divides and divisions. Amen? It's even working to come into the home. It's all about the entitlement mentality these days. Well, it's, I'm entitled to this. I, I ought to be living better than this. And it's the way of the world. And it's crept in. And Jesus responds to Pilate's question. Are you a king? Jesus said, I am a king. And immediately, he gives a little exposition there to Pilate. And he lets him know, I am a king and I have a kingdom. The truth of the matter is, we talk too much about church and not enough about the kingdom. Amen? Denominations or demon nations cause division. They cause division in the body of Christ. Why? Why do they cause such division? Because someone found a truth out of the Word of God. They dissected a truth, pulled it out, and they built a whole monument around a truth. 
instead of the whole counsel of the Word of God. And that's a deception. So you've got this sect over here. It's just as it was in the days of Jesus. You had the Sadducees and the Pharisees and then those that were of Paul and those were of Apollos and those were of this baptism or that baptism. And Paul squashed it. And he said, we are all of one baptism. We were baptized into Jesus Christ of one body. It's about a kingdom. Jesus reveals that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, and I find it so when I thought of Pilate standing there, he had, no, he had no preconceived idea except for little things he had heard of this Jesus. His wife had had a dream. It's funny how people say, you know, well, I, they've never been to church or they've never... Um, They've never uh, been taught the Word of God or whatever. So they make that excuse of, as to why they don't have to adhere or, or obey or check out or look more into the things of God. They use it as a cop-out. But even his wife, God spoke to her in a dream. God is always reaching out to people. God's always trying to reveal Himself to people. And I find it very interesting that God comes to her and she has this dream and says, have nothing to do with this man. Don't touch this. But yet, his hands are tied. Politically, he's bound. And man, today, I, I just, when I was looking back over this story and folks, I, I could see the conflict in our nation. How there are politicians and there are people in government that are Christian. They bear the name Christian. At some point, they did accept Christ as their Savior but you know what? It's not politically correct for them to stand up for Jesus. Guys, we got to get past that. It might not be politically correct on your job, but let me tell you something. Your home is not here. We are a traveler passing through. Amen? And this is a short time span here on this earth. And I will be accountable for all eternity for what I do here on earth. I would rather lose my job and stand up for the things of God than I would deny Him. And our silence has become agreement. I'm going to say it again. Our silence has become agreement. Because we are silent to the things of the world and their agenda, then they think, well, the church is okay with that. We can go ahead and do it. And they're marching out their devious, diabolical plan that is born in the pits of hell by the devil. And they're leading a generation into hell because they're denying that there is a God. Even though all creation testifies that there is a God. And just like with Pilate's wife, the Lord spoke to her in a dream. But Pilate doesn't acknowledge that. He tries to cover himself later on in Scripture by washing his hands of it, saying, I'm clean from this. This man's blood is not going to be on my hands. But he already made the decision. See, guys, we can't, we can't wash our hands of the blood in our nation. Can't wash the blood off of our hands of those that we were supposed to share the gospel with but didn't. In Ezekiel, he said, I will go and I will tell them the truth so that their blood may not be on my hands. All we're responsible for is sharing the truth. Yeah. is giving them the truth in love. We know the truth. There's 66 books of the Bible that's full of God's truth. Amen? His Word is truth. And we know the Spirit of God lives in us. And He is the Spirit of truth. John 14. And He is the teacher of all things. So we have the Spirit of truth that lives in us. And we know what's right and what's wrong. And there's this thing called discernment. 
And you better have it in these last days. You better have discernment because the Bible says if the days were not shortened, even the elect would have been deceived. So you better know truth. You better know truth. When the battle comes, is not the time to start questioning and saying, well, is God real? Is He not real? Is He going to save me? Is He a deliverer? You have to know it. Know it in your knower. Not just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge. Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You have to know it. I remember Pastor Parsley preaching, and he said, you know what kept him as a teenager out of the back seat of a car with a young lady? It was that he thought at any moment the rapture could take place, and he didn't want to be caught in that situation. It was a holy fear. And that's good. He knew enough of the truth of the Word of God that in a twinkling of an eye, in a second, in a moment, he could come back. And what do we want to get caught doing? When he comes back, it's a sobering thought. It's truth. And it's love. They have to go hand in hand. Jesus there, he didn't condemn Pilate. He never said anything to him. He spoke truth to him. He presented the truth there to Pilate. Jesus shares his mission or purpose with Pilate to testify to the truth. In Jesus' last hours, He actually gives Pilate an opportunity. Pilate could have asked Him, Really? Tell me more about this truth. He said, I came to testify and bear witness to truth. In all reality, the truth was standing right before Him, embodied there. The one who stood boldly against every lie of the enemy, saying that man would never be saved, that the devil had the victory, that the blood of goats and lambs was temporary, was a temporary fix to an eternal problem. And Jesus stood there as the truth right before Pilate. John 8, 31 says, To the Jews who have believed Him, Jesus said, If you hold to My teaching, you are really My disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you hold to My teaching, you are My disciples. Jesus took twelve men, called them out from the world, Drop what you're doing. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he discipled them. He spoke into their lives for three years. Truth, 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 truth. In so much so that when Peter and John are arrested after Jesus' death in the book of Acts, I believe it's Acts 4, when they're arrested there and brought before the Pharisees and Sadducees, they spoke boldly the Word of God and proclaimed that Jesus was the Lord. And the Pharisees and Sadducees says, obviously these are uneducated, untrained men, but there's no denying that they have been with Jesus. Truth. It's like flicking a light switch on in a dark room. Truth. That truth will set you free. It's not that we take the Word of God that is true and we come and we beat people over the head with the Word of God and say, accept the truth. Take the truth. Swallow this hard pill. No. But as we come to them and we go, I know the truth that I was bound, but Jesus set me free. The truth of the matter is that all have fallen short of the glory of God. But 1 John 1 9 says, If I confess my sins unto Him, He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. The truth of the matter is, God still loves you in your mess. The truth of the matter is, God will love you through your mess. And God will love you out of your mess. And the truth of the matter is, if I truly love you, I'll get down in your mess with you and help you out. That's the love of God. That's the truth of God's Word. It was that Jesus was willing to take on Himself our mess. 
That He was willing to lay aside His glory, His righteousness, His purpose, His excellent, radiant splendor. The beauty of holiness. And wrap Himself in human flesh in filth. And walk this earth as a man and take upon him the sins of the world. He took upon himself the cross, despising its shame for the joy that was set before him. The joy of knowing that he had redeemed. He went to his daddy and he said, Daddy, I did it. I've brought them home, I've saved our children. I've redeemed them. I ransomed them from the grave. When the clutches of hell had his nasty death, had his fingers wrapped around them, I broke the power of death, hell, and the grave, and I took the keys from it. And now they're free. He is the truth. Pilate replies, like that of the world today, many are searching for something real, something true. With many giving their version of the truth today in so many gray areas, I fear that the enemy is skillfully weaving a web of deception, capturing those who are lured into it by the enticement. We're being lured in. The devil's baiting. He's baiting us. And the thing is, guys, he puts fear in us that says, you can't do that. When did it become unlawful? To be a Christian. I don't see any law written on the books yet that says it's illegal to testify of Jesus. God forbid. I'll tell you what, if we don't stand up now, it will happen very soon. They will call it a hate crime. If you call sin, sin. Even if you're doing it in love. And because the devil has gotten a hold of a few ignorant people, and I will say that they are ignorant because they blatantly stand and judge people. Jesus said, Judge not, for in the same manner that you judge, ye shall be judged also. Now that doesn't mean that we sway from teaching truth. That we say there is a standard that we as Christians live by. That there are principles to the Word of God and we must adhere to them. Be ye holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Come out from among them and be ye separate from them, says the world. Do you not know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God? No man can serve two masters. That's Bible. So I'm not saying, but there's got to be truth and love. The Bible is a two-edged sword, able to cut and to divide the soul from the spirit. It is a two-edged sword, and the way I look at that two-edged sword is like this. One, the truth can cut you, but on the other side, it can heal. In other words, the the Word of God is a dual-edged sword. And yielded in the right hand of a child of God, a spirit-filled believer, it's powerful. It's quick. It's sharp. Amen? That's what the Bible says. And it will cut, yes. It may hurt at first. But it will heal. It will bring about healing. It will bring about freedom. Because why? You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Amen? Pilate's reply, what is truth is difficult to interpret. Was it fascist, scornful, impatient, despairing or sincere? We don't know. But out in the world today, people are looking for truth. They want the truth. They've been told that this book is a lie or it's fiction. And that those who believe in it are believing a fairy tale. I don't argue with people anymore when I go out and I I share the gospel with people. I refuse to argue over doctrine. 
I refuse to argue with anyone when it comes to the things of God. I, at, for, at first, I would sit there and I'd try to debate with people. And you can't reason someone to Jesus. You cannot reason them to the Lord. Because if I can reason you into Christ, you can be reasoned right out of it. So I'm not going to sit here and try to theologically debate with you why you should become a Christian. Why you should give your heart to God. Why He should be Lord of your life. I will tell you the truth. Why? And I will argue with you. Why? Because anyone that doesn't hold absolute truth is at the mercy of the man that does hold absolute truth. And when you are a Christian and you know that you are a son or child of God, you hold absolute truth. There's no argument. You want to see somebody get red in the face and blow up and their head spin around on their shoulders? Don't argue with them. State the fact of the Word of God that you hold absolute truth. And hey, it is what it is. Accept it or reject it. But I just laid it in your lap. I'm just the delivery boy. I didn't write the newspaper, but I put it on your doorstep. It's your choice to pick it up and read it or accept it or not. We hold absolute truth. You don't have to argue about it. It's not an argument. It's not an argument that God still heals. It's not an argument that He still delivers. There's no argument to it. There's no debating it. There's no reasoning it out. It's an absolute truth. Why am I not healed then? Maybe you don't believe fully then. I don't know. Why aren't my loved ones saved? Maybe it's because you haven't decided in your heart they're already saved. You're claiming it by faith. Absolute truth. That as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. In other words, my household will be saved. Absolute truth. There's too much wavering between two opinions. If God is God, serve Him. If He's not, walk away. But I choose to serve the Lord. I will go against the tide. I will walk upstream. Even if everyone else is on a fast track to hell, I'm not going to join them. I will reach my hands out and try to grab as many people as I can along with and say, hey, turn around. You're going the wrong direction. But ultimately, we are responsible to give them the truth and love. And it's their choice. They are free moral agents. They have a free will. And it's not our job to be judge, jury, and and executioner in the church. And God forbid that we ever bring down condemnation upon someone. Because as soon as we do that, if not for the grace of God, if not for the grace of God, so go I. You don't know you're one prayer away from being in the same situation or circumstance that they're in. So God forbid, walk in love, share the truth in love, but leave the, the, the judging to the Lord. And the thing is, every man worketh out his own salvation with fear and trembling before God. We're all walking out our salvation before the Lord. Now we need guidance and we need direction along the way, yes. And that's why God has elders and God has uh, spiritual fathers and things in our lives and thank God for them that will reach out and say, hey, you're headed in the wrong direction. Straighten it up. Turn it around. That's truth. The question is, can we handle the truth and correction when it comes? And we need to. Matthew 7.15 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. The people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Guys, all we're supposed to be is fruit inspectors. If you really want to know someone is a Christian or whatever, 
go and inspect their fruit. Are they walking in the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering. Check your fruit. Feels a little rotten. Smells a little funky. I'm not eating that. God gave me something a long time ago. He said, I will send to you people to be in your life and you will know them by their fruit. Can you eat of their tree? Man, if you don't feed me, if you're always coming and wanting to pick my fruit and I'm never getting nothing back from you, hey, something's messed up here. We're supposed to share fruit. You know, God says grow fruit, not be a fruit, by the way. Amen? The church is not supposed to be like breakfast cereal, full of nuts, fruits, and flakes. Okay? But we can inspect each other's fruit. Say, so, hey, brother, you might need to prune stuff back here a little bit so you can grow more fruit. Spend a little more time in the Word. Spend a little more time in prayer. So you can grow fruit. Jesus gives us the the thing here. False prophets. Those that are teaching false doctrine. You'll know them by the fruit. And just because they got a huge big crowd doesn't mean they're speaking truth. How do you remember the story of the Pied Piper? You remember that story? Little fairy tale growing up. Little Pied Piper came in playing his little flute. What did he do? He led all the children out of the village, right? He sang his little song, did his little dance, and everyone followed right behind him. And then there was no children. Today, the the enemy's doing the same thing. He gives just enough truth to make it sound like it's Bible, but there's poison mixed in with it. And if you eat that fruit, it will kill you. It's laced. It's laced. You better know who you're listening to and be able to receive it as the truth of the Word of God. And don't check your brain at the door when you're listening to someone preach or teach of the Word of God or whatever. Because, like Bishop said, there's antichrist spirits already in the world and they are spewing out their deception. And there may be enough truth, enough truth in there to where it sounds like, Grandma, Grandma said that I think out of the Bible. Is that right? I remember that from Sunday school or whatever. Or it sounds good. I'll be a good person. The road or the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. Amen? But there's only one way to heaven. Matthew seven twenty one says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then Jesus said, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Did we not do this all in your name? No, you did it for your own gain. You used the gospel for profit, is what Paul tells them, tells them in Corinthians. That they used the gospel for profit. Many false apostles. Jesus warns us to beware of false prophets. You will know them by their fruit. Many false religions in the world today, many things, but we have to know the truth of the Word of God. Amen? One way, and I'll tell you this, so you can know this in your knower. One major way, just a big warning sign, how to recognize a cult. 99.9% of them will do this. They use Bible. They say it's Bible. They'll read out of the Bible. But in there, one of the main things they do, they will, every single one, and I could list them off for everybody I'm not, of all these different religions that use the Bible, the one thing they do is they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They deny that He is the Son of the living God, that He is God in the flesh. They say He's a Son of God or that He is an angel that God used. But they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. That's the number one red flag how to 
notice and recognize a cult, if you have any suspicion at all, just ask them, who is Jesus then? We hold these truths to be self-evident. One, God cannot lie. Numbers twenty three nineteen. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? This truth we hold evident. God cannot lie. Because if God says it's going to happen, God cannot lie. And God's promises over your life are not a lie. God didn't speak a lie over you. The enemy may come to you and go, that wasn't God. When you know you felt it at the time and you knew it was the Spirit of the Lord that spoke to you and He said, it will come to pass, Paul, it will come to pass. Amen? His word shall not return void. God is not a man that He should lie. He doesn't take back His promise. His call is without repentance. Amen? God cannot lie. Secondly, we hold this truth to be self-evident. God's Word is true. John seventeen seventeen says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. God's Word is true. Amen? The Bible says, Heaven and earth may pass away, but His Word shall endure forever. Amen? God's Word is truth. And you better know this Word. You better hide it in your heart. You better teach it to your children and to their children. Amen? If if the parents aren't going to do it, the grandparents better do it. Someone better get truth into this generation. Somehow, some way, we've got to share the truth of the Gospel of Jesus Christ with this generation. Wow. That went over like a lead balloon. I think three of y'all got that one. It's only, I don't mean to be mean, but this is where it's going to come to, right here, right here, right now. And this is it. If you're not sharing the truth with those around you, it's because of one or two things. One, you're either ashamed of the truth or two, you don't know the truth. Period. You either don't know it or you're ashamed of it. I started this morning to ask everyone in here, when was the last time that you actually led someone to Jesus Christ? That you personally went out of your way to go to someone and look them in the eye and go, you know what? I don't know what it is, but God just brought me to you today and said, hey, God wants you to know He loves you. And I don't know if you know anything about the Bible or not, if you know anything about Jesus Christ or not, but I want to tell you about Jesus. You can open up with that right there and go right into your testimony. You can go right into an experience. You can share with them whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to share with them. But ultimately, it should end in this right here. Today, if you died today and you had to spend eternity, there's one or two places where you would spend eternity. And there's only one way to spend eternity in heaven with God, and that is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Do you want to do that today? You know what? We think, that can't happen. I can't do that. It's not you. It's the Holy Spirit. And in the very hour that you're brought before kings and princes and priests or men, the Spirit of God will fill your mouth with the words that you should speak. All you got to do is start. You just got to start. You got to initiate it. And the Holy Spirit will come with the anointing. Why? Because He's an evangelist. And He will preach through you. He will testify through you. He will testify of Jesus. That's Bible. It's John 14. That's more truth. Are you getting some truth this morning? Third thing we hold self-evident is God's Word holds all things together. In Hebrews 1 and 3, it says, The Son of radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty in heaven, so He became as much superior as of the angels as the name he has inherited to be superior to theirs. By the power of his word, he holds all things together. We keep hearing about this or that or whatever. God's got it. Everything's held together by his word. Amen? We must be convinced. Second Timothy 12 says, That is why I am suffering as I am. 
Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced. See, we're not convinced. We're not truly convinced. Today, I'm not trying to produce an argument to you or convince you. I'm just trying to say, hey, read the Word for yourself. Pray for yourself. Feel God for yourself. Know He's real for yourself. Look unto the hills from which come with your help for yourself. See that God is real today. See that God is, God's Word is real. God will not lie. That God's going to bring it to pass. Amen? Are you convinced? Are you convinced? Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. I know Jesus. I know who I put my trust in. And I am convinced that He is able to guard what I have entrusted to Him for that day. I know in whom I have believed. Do you know, really, honestly, who you believe in? He's the God of all the universe. And you are His people, His church, His bride. Are you convinced today? In closing, truth may be the cry of what is real or that shining light illuminating a darkened path for the traveler to find his way. Truth could possibly be a profound statement of hope or assurance. Truth, however, is influenced by one's perception. Yet in a world filled with deception and lies where the truth is too often forgotten or misconstrued, in a society where personal gain or pleasure is placed far above any level of integrity, truth must rise up as a mighty tower of strength and stability while holding a firm foundation grounded in the, bed, in the bedrock of Jesus Christ Himself. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3.10, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. This foundation of biblical truth is what we must place above, place all of our hope, our faith, and security in. Not only for ourselves today, but for future generations also. Jesus spoke of two men in a parable. Both men built houses. One built his house on the sand and the other built his house on a rock. But when the great storm came, only one house survived. The one built on the rock. Matthew 25, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. God's truth will stand the test of time. It will weather the storms of life. And all who take refuge in its shelter will be saved. Is your life or future built on the rock, Christ Jesus? Or is your life in the sinking sand of false reality? The truth shall prevail. The truth shall prevail. In John 14, 6, Jesus answered them and said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. If any man comes unto the Father, he must come through me, through Jesus. My question to you today is can you handle the truth? Can you handle the truth? I'm tired of playing church. I know we don't hear, but I mean, I'm tired of the church playing. Let's put it that way. It's time to start being who God's called us to be. That's truth. That we can go to one another in love and speak the truth in love to one another without offenses being made and without people being hurt and and offended and running off because they can't handle truth. The truth is today, God loves you and I love you. That's truth. And God loves you a whole lot more than I do. That's truth. Because I haven't died for any one of you in here. 
but he did. No greater love has a man than he lay down his life for his friends. 